Hello, BookTube. I have a guest. As you can see, my friend Sam, he's been in many, many videos. You're practically an honorary BookTuber. Oh, I have been in so many. I'm not sure that it's a thank you thing. It could be a curse of some kind. <laughs> but we have a tag that we're going to do this morning. It's a tag that I've already done. It went viral on BookTube, but it's fascinating stuff. And I, I'm interested in, I'm not sure that I know your answers to some of these questions. This is the finish the book tag which I'm just going to do with every guest that I, that I have. Question number one is, do you keep a list of the books that you have read? Of any all kind the books that I've read? Any kind of log? No. Do you remember a long time ago, pre-Goodreads, there was something called the library thing? When that started, I, I actually did attempt to, uh, to list all of the books that I could remember having read. And then, I, and then library thing ceased to be a thing. Library thing, is, does it still exist? I don't know. And you don't have, obviously, Goodreads I don't or anything Goodreads. else. That was the number one answer on this, was that people use Goodreads for all kinds yeah, of Yeah, I think it would be fun to do that. I remember trying to, actually trying to go back in time and remember even when I was a child reading books and just see if I could find all the titles. And I pulled them up from my memory a lot of mm. pretty obscure stuff that I had forgotten about. Yeah. But no list. Just sort of keep it in your, the book is wrong with your brain. Uh, yeah, if it's there at all. <laughs> All right. Uh, question number two is: What stats do you record? Any? Do you record any stats? Any stats? No. I mean, no. I mean, I, I'm a slightly special case in that I review a huge number of the books that I read, so that there are there is evidence of my reading of them on the internet at all times. So that's a kind of a stat. Otherwise, no, I don't keep any so, stats. Like, for instance. Uh, the kind of stats keeping that is very popular, I think, perniciously so, uh, in the reading community, including on parts of BookTube, would be stats in terms of... How many books you've read for your reading? No, that's the only one that I keep. Uh, but no, stats in terms of the demographic spread. How many women do you read? Oh. For instance, how many minorities do you read? That sort of thing. But you don't keep stats no, on any of that. I don't have a spreadsheet, but like I, like I say, I mean, I, my, my public reading... Fortunate in that nobody's ever interested no. in the <laughs> answers to these questions. No. So. no. And when you think about it yourself, if I can elaborate on the questions just a little bit. Sure. If, when you think about that sort of thing yourself, that kind of so-called distribution <clears throat> or representation, mm -hmm. is your idea that you read so widely that it will sort itself out? I do sort of think that. I, I think that what my reading needs to reflect what's being published. So I think that, I mean, you do have to be... You have to be a little bit aware of it, but I do think that uh, if you are paying attention to what is being published, I think then the ratios that are there are probably going to be reflected onto the ratios okay. of your reading. That, that, again, that's extremely specific to my case, and I think if you were just a, a, just a, a regular reader, maybe maybe you wouldn't want to make that pointed effort to even list just for your own just for your own. But I do find that uh, as publishing stats have changed, that my my reading has changed. That's interesting. So your 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 stats is that you reflect the publishing. I think so. I try to in fiction. I, yeah, we should we should fiction. stress Sam just Sam Wright reads in fiction, contemporary fiction, <laughs> with the occasional interesting reprint, and every once in a while a diversion into nature, or if somebody makes a Cape Cod or a Martha's Vineyard book. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. And both of us will swerve in the direction of a Cape Cod or a mouth is really good. It's really good. Great to do that for. Uh, question number three is, do you give star ratings? Now, I know the answer is no, but we can broaden the question to um, when you are, you, Sam is a, a professional book reviewer. <laughs> He's a full-time book reviewer, much like myself. Uh, when you don't give star ratings any more than I do, but do you, is there a part of your mind that, say watches but that is that is aware of how often you extremely praise a book or how often you pan the book mm -hmm. I mean, is there is there a part of your of your mind that is thinking am i just feeling good in the rest of my life and so i'm <laughs> overpraising these books or am i feeling crabby 
in the rest of my life. Maybe maybe my kid is not eating his spinach, so I'm going to slap this book around for eight hundred words. Something like that. Do you, is there a watchdog part of your brain to yeah, regulate that? I think so. Yeah, yeah, I do think about that because. Uh, and the other thing I think about is, if you review a book, your review, the the evaluation aspect of the review will really depend on the aspects of the book that you focus on that you decide to pay the most attention to, especially if you're doing a pretty short review. So if there's one element of the book that you really focus on and you think that is, for whatever reason, because you find it the most interesting to talk about that element of the book, if that element is really good or really flawed, then the overall impression of the book that you give is going to be filtered through that one sort of that one angle in which you're approaching it. Now, often you'll then, in a book review, they'll say, you know, on the other hand, this part is opposite of what I'm saying, or this part counteracts the, the impression I'm giving. But nevertheless, whatever the focus is. So I sort of, re I often know and realize that even though I would stand by my judgments, I'm also aware that I could have written a totally different review of the same book with a different focus that would probably, maybe, hopefully have the same sort of overall judgment and impression of the book, but right. nevertheless would be slightly different in terms, uh, would be different in sort of gradations based right. on what the focus was. But your hope is that no matter how you change the focus, it's not going to change a, a bad book into a good book. No, it's not, no, but it's usually not, I mean, if you're if you decide to rave about a book, that's one thing. You read a book, you're just hugely impressed by it, and you just go, the focus of this review is just going to be me saying, this is really good, please read it, and I'll sh show you reasons. And if you read a really bad book, the focus of your review is usually just going to be, this book's terrible, please don't read it again. <laughs> here's, here's why. But most reviews are like, this book you know, is interesting but flawed. That's just what most books are, or very flawed but has some redeeming aspects. So you, so in, so that's not, that in itself is not an interesting focus for a review because most books are like that. You have to pick out an aspect of it to then elaborate on, to develop on, to explore the ideas, you know, the things that are sort of even outside the book itself, how the book fits into a larger context of those ideas. And so as a result, the impression of the book, you still have to get it in there and you might be broadly positive or might score it broadly negative or whatever, but the focus of the review is not even necessarily on the judgment of the book itself, but that judgment still has to come through, and so it, serve, it sometimes is a secondary aspect of the review, and I think about, and then, so I think about that a lot, where I'll review something, and then I'll realize, I haven't even completely made it clear whether I think I should <laughs> read this book or not, because what I'm actually saying without saying it is, I'm just going to tell you something interesting about this book, and then you decide if you want to read it or not. I, it's not so incredible that I'm urging you, urging everyone in the world to read it. It's not so terrible that I'm saying, stay the hell away from it. I'm saying, here's what it is. If it seems interesting to you, then go ahead and try it. So, so to, for, to a very large extent, the actual judgment of the book that I'm using for consideration is, in my mind, a second of secondary importance, if that makes sense. I like to dance in the entrails. <laughs> yes. And also tell jokes. <laughs> Occasionally. <laughs> well, sometimes that's the point of the review. Yes. Sometimes, sometimes that has to be <laughs> what it's about. <laughs> it's just about wanting to do that. Yes. <laughs> uh, all right, well, question number four is, uh, is, is do you review your books? Because you've written well over a dozen in your lifetime. <laughs> Do I review my books? Yes. Well, I, actually, the, the variation on the question that we could ask here would be, what is there a percentage of the books that you read that you don't review? When, when I used to work at a, at a used bookstore, a customer came in once and was looking for a, the first edition of a Joyce Carol Oates novel so he could take it to a reading and get it signed. And we had about 20 books, but everyone was already signed by Joyce Carol Oates. <laughs> It was impossible to find an unsigned <laughs> Joyce Carol Oates first edition. And, and the joke was, a book would come in and we'd go, ah, the rare unsigned Joyce Carol Oates. And it would be worth more because it was unsigned. For me, it's the, the, the rare, unreviewed book. <laughs> you know, I read a book that I haven't reviewed. Occasionally, I will do that, yes. It's a strange book. Okay, well, 
the answer the uh, the answer here is fairly obvious. But what if we were to elaborate a little? What what are the elements when you, as you put it, when you read into a book, when you're doing your first exploring? About yeah. it, surely there are some books where you do that and you realize after a certain amount of time there isn't anything here. Yes. Even the kind of balanced judgment that you're talking about would be boring for you to write and boring for people to read. There just isn't anything reviewable here. Yeah. Even though the book isn't maybe doing anything explicitly wrong. If the book doesn't have some sort of larger extra literary peg that you go in with and you just don't want to pick it up, you just pick it up and read it. I'm sorry to say, but it's just... It, I'm not sorry to say it because it's an intangible that actually anyone who is paying, who's reading closely could be a reviewer. Anyone who is reading closely should be able to see what that intangible is. And it's really just the authority and strength of the writing. If, if you think something stands out to you in the writing, if it has a particular confidence or a particular strength or a particular ability or a particular beauty, if there's something to it, if there's something that gives it energy and electricity or gives it intelligence, that, that's got to come out. You can't you can't write a good book and have a boring, flat first ten pages. You can't. I mean, I suppose you can. Um, there, there's some extremely meta or postmodern strategy where that happens. <laughs> or the brothers Karamazov. <laughs> <That's a funny laughs> <one. Right. laughs> it's not the usual thing. <laughs> Most writers aren't going to be Dostoevsky, so it's not right. going to really like matter that. <laughs> right. But there, surely there are, in other words, stillborn books. Surely there are books that you encounter every week. It's uh, what I'm what I'm trying to, to say here is you do, you you uh, review every book you read, but you don't review every book you start. No, 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 no. no there are no, plenty no, no. Of, of misses. You try you try a million books. Yeah, you try them all, and you do you do you read the first five pages, or or if you're not sure after that, you flip to another and read a scene. You know, you're looking for something in the writing. A lot of books are published because of what they're about. There's not much as a reviewer that you can do with it because you can describe what it's about and then what are you supposed to do? I mean, you can't really, you can't really disagree with, I suppose you can disagree with the author, but a novel is not so much what it's about. It's about how it approaches what it's about. Um, so well, that, so you, that's what you're So you have tried your hand at reviewing <laughs> from time to time. <laughs> uh, question number five is where do you put your finished books? What do you do with your books? Yeah, I don't keep most of them. Most of them I give away, but I have a I have a shelf in my room, a tiny, tiny room, which is my office, and my apartment is in there. Um, so I just line the bookshelves, and that's where everything is sorted to be read, has been read, or is going to be kept. And when you're, so let's say in the course of a month, mm -hmm. you review what? Probably fifty books in a month, no. something like that. Thirty books in a month. No, no, in a month, like twelve. Three ten weeks. to twelve. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, let's say of those twelve, do you, do you periodically reflect on those and think, well, these I definitely want to keep. Yeah, I think it's. I think it's. I or do you know that right away? Maybe it's, it's not reflection. I feel it's similar to what you do. There's two two ways to keep a book. One is you keep it until the end of the year, and then the other is you keep it. There's probably, you know, there's probably maybe one or two every month or three that I'll keep until the end of the year when I do sort of the year summation. Mm -hmm. And then you got to decide after that what you want to keep. And the reason you might keep something is because it really impressed you and you, you loved it, but also it could be because it's going to be useful. You know, the author has another book yeah. coming out soon and you just think, I don't know, I want to refer to this. So I think it's, you know, it's a kind of balance. But, uh, Okay, number six, utterly fascinating. How do you pick your next book? Yeah. Uh, okay. Because you're, you're going to be a lot like, the broad strokes going to be a lot like me. 90% of my reading, the publishing world picks for me, yes. at least in the broad scope. Yes. I, if I look at an upcoming week, I'm not going to be thinking about the new releases from 1992. I'm, I'm not going to be thinking about backlist to right. call it backlist. I'm not going to be thinking about that at all. Right. So the so right. So the overwhelming, the, the biggest criterion is publish publish date publishing date. That's that's the big one because you know you can't you can't add a book to review if it needs to be 
I want to be at the close to the beginning of the day to publish it. Sometimes I'll do something like that and yes. put it as a few months ago. But in general... But usually, so a, a main determining factor is the calendar. When you're making a calendar, when you're making a, a, a schedule, Books are being published, and then after that, it's it's uh, then you have to figure out. So then every week, books are published on Tuesdays, which is busy. Um, so I will review stuff to run the weekend before that Tuesday, or after that, but no, not early. I think the I think two weeks from now I'll be publishing it, but I'll but I'll. I can schedule a book to be reviewed to appear in the Saturday paper for a book that's going to be published on Tuesday. So that so so then every week, every Tuesday, there's probably one if we're talking if it's a literary fiction, there's probably that is seems really there's probably literary fiction. ten to fifteen books that might be under consideration, maybe three or four. Um, the beginning of the month is is usually top heavy. There's going to be a lot of stuff in the first week. Um, okay, so when you get to those ten or fifteen books, then what? How, once you've done that, yeah. then how do you finish? Exactly. So then you length. <laughs> well, <laughs> so many reviewers is, are terrified by very long books. <laughs> that is part of it. If a book is really, really long, then I can't do. I, I will feel that I can't. I have to do it long. I can do a long book, but not as a round number. I can do it in little bursts. So, so then I would have to feel that it deserved its sort of a standalone. Thing. I mean, most people when they review, they just they just review one book, so they get a, a special case or review the entire book. It's called a, the fiction chronicle. It's not a round number. It's a round number. It's little three little review. Pieces. Yes, exactly. Always a joy when you do a long book review. That's always a joy. Yeah, well, but. it's fun to do. It's a different way of approaching it. It's, it's different variation. Anyhow, you have to. I don't know. There's a lot of. I mean, there's a million considerations. One is if it's if it's a really big publishing event, then you might not be in on it. One, if it's a writer with Steam. Yeah, well, I was going to say there must be important. a personal. There must be when you're looking yeah. at those ten books, you must think, "Oh, I really like this author." That's yes. definitely going to be a contender. Yes, but I'm also at the point where I might like or appreciate an author, but I've already reviewed that author like four times, and I just have no more things to say about mm -hmm. the the writer. So that you you want to be careful about sort of repeating yourself on other things, especially as you get sort of into books. Um, I don't know. I like to do things. reviewers aren't supposed to repeat themselves. <laughs> This is terrifying news. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> I've lost track in 2023 alone. I have lost track of how many times I have typed the sentence, this book has no bibliography and that is inexcusable. <laughs> I have typed that sentence probably 20 times in 2023. <laughs> if you Google your name and the word rollicking, how many, <laughs> how many, how many pieces? It's a good much? word. <laughs> What's wrong with rollicking? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, if we let's hurry right on. Uh, <laughs> when we worked at a Barnes and Noble, we would do staff picks, and one of the first, the first, the first uh, times I, I was around Steve, he was doing staff picks, and he was eagerly sort of writing them out. And someone came over and went, "Oh, Steve, not rollicking again." <laughs> it's a good evocative word. I'm fond of a good rollick myself. <laughs> But then uh, question number seven is, do you have any rituals for when you finish a book? A ritual? What does that mean exactly? Well, people have been doing this tag and giving lots of examples. Do you, do you for instance, like I have one myself where I, I will pause for a minute and just quietly think, what was that experience I just oh. But other people do, they put it in a certain place or they put the bookmark at the beginning of oh, the book I see. or something like that. I'd imagine in your case the answer is probably no. If the book is really good, then you actually you do want to be alone. You want to sit quietly and, and think about what happens. If a book really worked on you, then absolutely you you, you need. Uh, it can be a lot of time. It can be ten minutes. It can be half an hour where you actually are just just holding the book and thinking about all this the stuff happened. If it really worked on you until the end, the way a, a good book really will. An egg. Otherwise, sat for a long time. Yeah. Otherwise, no. I probably wish it was just 
Yes, it's just, you have no time. I, I mean, uh, you have no time. You've got so such a crowded schedule. But but so you do you will do that with an impressive book. Like what was yeah. that? Uh, yeah, that's that's a great that was, that's a great that? feeling when you're just like because the reason is that when a book is really good, it's working on you emotionally. So you finish it and you're like a storm of emotions, and then those start to settle a little bit and then you start to think about but how did that happen how did those emotions work on me how did that author do that or i i completely turned off the analytical side of myself or not completely but i really turned it off and i was completely swept up in this book and then those emotions settle or they disperse and they, they go away as they as they will for anything and then you think well how did that happen how did i get so wound up in this thing what happened how did the author do it and then you want to think about that and it's like a that's a great I mean, that's doesn't happen often. When we talked about like what's the sort of book you rave about, that's one of the books you're gonna do. When a book can do that, when it can completely sweep you up and then and then leave you with all of those questions that you're trying to figure out, like how did that work? How did the author do that? That whole sensation of of joy is like of of reading a book and you encounter that afresh, like with a new book, if someone has pulled that off again, then it's a it's fantastic. And you do want to be in the moment thinking about that and just being like, how did that, how did that happen? Because you want to, you have really experienced what you're hoping to experience. So that's at least a kind of a ritual. That's yes, yes, yes. And most books, you know, they don't do Most that. books don't do that. Most books you can, you, most books, because you are not completely pulled in emotionally, you are, at least I am, working out the, the moral and the intellectual and analytical side. As I read yeah, it. as you go along, and then right. the book will finish, and I'll go. <clears throat> okay, I, that was good. You know, I saw how that worked. Yeah, but you I, had but you I had two or three things that you wanted to do. I saw you do them. I know how you did them. Yes, that sort of thing. Right, I, right but, as opposed to but effectively, you just did magic. Effectively, I worked it out before it happened or as it happened. Right, but exactly. But the you just did magic thing, and it's not magic. So let me try to untangle the <laughs> thing. Yeah, it's a great. That's a great. And it happens. There's ton, ton, tons of books that do it. I mean, like you say, it's not, it's not, it's not, uh, it's it's less common than any other experience, but it still happens all the time. Yeah, that's that, that's the point that I always make <clears throat> uh, to my imaginary friends on BookTube uh, is that that ex <clears throat> uh, <laughs> that feeling is why we all read. Yes, to to keep getting that feeling. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? She's just staring at you. Oh, oh goodness. Oh. <laughs> well, question number eight is who do you tag if you're not actually on BookTube? And you'd have to tag Micah Cummins anyway because he's sort of this teeny overlord that just <laughs> rules all of our destiny. Oh, no. Is he the new tyrant? No, of he's the new tyrant. He's oh, awful. Dear. <laughs> he's just awful. It's always the, the fresh faced one. Yes. Oh, God. About. <laughs> Sounds like a Nero sort of figure. <laughs> But so that is the finish the book tag. You've done another book tag. Wow. Oh, there you go. <laughs> okay, I got through it. Lots and lots of book talk here. It's been lots of fun. And of course, we'll be right back. Always. Say goodbye, Peter. <laughs> so long, book two. We'll see you soon. <laughs>